right, here we go. Um, welcome everybody. I appreciate you spending your time here with, uh, with me and the community that's dialing in to hear about organizational culture. Um, I will say that this is a subject of great passion of mine. Uh, it, I believe it touches every aspect of your business. And really, I think that assessing culture requires some detective work to put all the pieces together. Uh, the term gets bandied about, the term culture, and it's often misused. So one goal of mine for today is to help unravel this. And now some of you out there might be thinking, gee, I'm doing all of these things I'm going to hear about already to build and manage my culture. And to that I say, cool. And I can uh, actually find out just how good a job you're doing uh, if you're interested. So uh, one, one bit of uh, housekeeping here as we go forward. Uh, as far as questions go, uh, if you have a question, you can type it into the um, chat box. I will try to answer them as they come up uh, if they fit into the flow of the presentation. Um, in the interest of time, I may save these to the end. I'm going to try to wrap up here in about 45 minutes <clears throat> so that we have some Q&A time. Uh, and I do plan on sending out an email uh, addressing any questions that we didn't get time to cover here during uh, the webinar. So here we go. What are we going to talk about? Well, I think it's important uh, to, to talk about some definitions. And why even bother with this? Why should we assess it? What's your role as a leader, owner uh, of your organization? How you embed this? How you embed culture in your, in your company? And is there an ROI? What is the return on investment? Is there a way of measuring this um, <clears throat> to maybe justify why I should be paying attention to it for those that want to go that route? And, and I will present a culture model for you that will give you some ideas about how culture works. I will introduce you to a tool that I have been using for many years uh, that assesses a, a culture. It's part of my process. And I will be presenting some culture project results for you um, projects that I have worked on over the years. So I think it will help tie things together. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Just want to tip my hand right away. There are many schools of thought about culture. And I happen to be a proponent of the behavioral school, which says that culture is about thinking and behaving. If I can see it and I can hear it, then I can measure it. And so my comments will be more slanted to this point of view as we go. So let's start with some definitions. What is culture? Culture, as, as the slide shows, are the characteristic patterns of thinking and behaving shaped by the shared beliefs, values, and underlying assumptions of an organization's members. Another way to think about this is culture is what we believe and know. It is a long-term thing and involves norms and expectations that influence how we think and behave. So again, behaviors are things we can see, we can hear. So if we think about norms being the accepted ways of behaving, then things you say and do would fall under that. Now, culture is not climate. Climate is about how it feels to be in the culture. These are terms that get confused often. And um, I'm hoping that you'll understand how these two relate uh, by the time I'm through with the presentation. So climate is how you perceive today. And this can change. So the little umbrella uh, up on uh, the area here with, with climate, it's like, how's the weather? If you want to know the weather, you look out the window. And this distinction is important because climate is an outcome of culture. And leaders need to attend to both culture and climate. But culture starts with the organization's underlying uh, values and beliefs. And you're going to hear this a lot going forward. So the brisket story. A um, little boy walks into the kitchen on the day that his family is preparing for a family dinner later that day. And he sees his mother getting the brisket ready to go in the oven, and he watches her cut the ends off, stick it in the pan, and put it in the oven. So little Mark says, hey, Mom, I have a question. Why do you cut the ends of the brisket off before you stick it in the oven? And Mom looks at little Mark and says, you know what? 
That's a good question. That's the way I learned to do it from my mother. Why don't you go ask your grandma? So little Mark goes and finds grandma and says, Grandma, I've got a question for you. Why does mom cut the ends of the brisket off before she puts it in the oven? And grandma says, wow, you know, that's the way we've always done it. That's the way I learned it. Why don't you go ask great grandma? So little Mark looks around and finds great grandma sitting out on the front porch, listening to the Bears game on the radio, and says, hey, great grandma, I have a question. Why do we cut the ends of the brisket off before we put it in the oven? And great grandma looks at him and says, you know, that's a good question. I've been wondering about that myself. The only reason I ever did it was because that was the only way it would fit into the pan that I had at the time. So thank you. I'm appearing here all week. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm hoping that the story conveys the message here that oftentimes we do things because that's the way we've always done them, and we don't necessarily know why, and we don't necessarily know that uh, there might be a better way to do things. Besides, in my world, the ends of the, ends of the brisket are, are my favorite part, and they didn't even make it in the oven. So the message here is culture happens. So whether you mean it to or not, you get a group of people together, you start a business, you form a club, norms will emerge. And not all of them are beneficial. So what I do is promote the concept of building culture with intent. To have the culture that will enable your organization to meet your goals and your vision and achieve high levels of performance. And as part of the presentation here, I want to leave you with a model, some language that you can maybe use with your shop to think about this and an understanding of how culture works. <clears throat> so this slide uh, is based on some work that was done by John Cotter and James Heskett at Harvard Business School. And they published a landmark book here a number of years ago uh, where they had done some in-depth studies of culture with about 200 organizations, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what they found was three characteristics of culture. The first is intensity, strong or weak. So what can you see? And we can think of these as observable styles or ways of doing things. So organizations perhaps might have a public statement of shared values that's followed by everybody. You might see these on websites and in marketing materials, uh, but there are also deeply rooted styles and values, goal alignment in ways that culture can outlast even the CEO. So I think of 3M as having a very strong level of intensity because their culture of innovation has been there since day one, and I'm not sure how many CEOs have been uh, sitting in the captain's chair at 3M, but it's been a lot of them. The second characteristic here is strategic appropriateness. So does the culture fit the industry segment or the business strategy? So the question to ask yourself is would an advertising agency be as effective with the same culture as a medical manufacturing plant? Or say a video game design shop versus a CPA firm? Maybe there would be some common elements. Most likely there would be some huge differences. So what's appropriate? And the third aspect is adaptability. Can your organization respond to changing environmental conditions? And that's only not only can you respond, but can you respond quickly enough? Some organizations are just really too rooted in their ways to be able to respond at all. Um, think of the brisket story again. So what Cotter and Heskett say is a strong plus an appropriate plus an adaptable set of characteristics is what they're using uh, the term as an, a performance-enhancing corporate culture. Those three elements, performance-enhancing corporate culture. So let's take a look at some other things here that are related to this. Why should I care? So what? Okay, performance-enhancing corporate culture, why is this a, something I should be aiming for? Well, for one thing, culture is the backbone of your organization. Every process that you have, communications, operations, HR practices, decision making, job designs, 
everything hangs on your culture. Okay? And culture is really about how things truly get done. If you want to know how things truly get done in your shop, hey, go undercover and ask a staff member. They'll tell you. And it might be very different than how you think or intended things get done. Um, when we talk about visibility, really what you say and do is visible to everybody, your customers, your suppliers, but especially to your staff. And are you consistent? Do you treat customers different than your staff? Do you treat them differently than your suppliers? The key here is to be consistent. Hey, wouldn't you like to know what's working for you and what might not be working for you in terms of achieving your goal strategies and ultimate success? I believe you're flying blind unless you're willing to take a look at how you might be getting in your own way. Uh, as far as setting behavioral standards and developmental targets for staff and setting hiring and promotion standards for fit, culture will help you clarify what behaviors are expected for everyone. And I'm a big believer in including cultural expectations in your performance reviews, your job descriptions, and your hiring process. How about mergers and acquisitions? What did I just buy? I just bought this company. Maybe I shouldn't have gone through with the deal. Maybe the cultures are too different. And, or maybe I need a strategy to make use of this if it's very different than my own. I have a story. I was working with a, uh, an engineering company uh, a few years ago, and they had just acquired a company out of the country that did similar but related work. They didn't pay attention to this the concept of cultures because the two organizations did things very differently. And they spent a lot of time on the phone blaming the other guy for how, why things aren't getting done. So had they spent the time to talk about how you operate, how we operate, and looking for ways to make this work, if things would have gone a whole lot smoother. <clears throat> so ROI, I mentioned it earlier. Is there an ROI for looking at culture? Let's take a look. So the study that I'm referring to here came from Cotter and Heskett at Harvard Business School. This spanned 12 years, involved over 200 organizations. So you had some big players like JCPenney, American Airlines, Hewlett Packard, Procter & Gamble involved in this. And um, Cotter and Heskett took a look at four parameters, revenue growth, employment growth, stock price growth, since these were all publicly traded companies, and net income. What they found, now just before I, I, before I tell you a, a little bit of the backstory here, this study was done 1977 to 1988. So people have said to me, gee, Mark, that's a while ago. How can this be relevant? And I say, if you think about what happened in the economy during that period of time, there was a boom, there was a market crash, and a recovery. So I believe that the lessons learned are still uh, applicable to today. So what Cotter and Heskett found is if we look at, if we look at um, this column, the average for 12 firms with these performance-enhancing cultures turned triple-digit performance. It only took 12 firms to come up with triple-digit performance story here. And some of the firms that were in this, Hewlett Packard, Walmart, American Airlines, fell into this list of 12. Looking at firms that did not have those performance-enhancing cultures, the performance difference is dramatic. 20 firms average now that fall into this side of the world included companies like JCPenney, Texaco, and the former Northwest Airlines, who is now part of Delta. So the data here suggests that there is a payback for paying attention to your culture and bringing it more in line with a what they define as their performance enhancing culture. All right. I'm going to start talking about a language shift here because I'm going to be morphing our, some of our terms into the terms that we'll be using going forward here uh, in the presentation. So you'll see the word adaptive. It's also the same thing as performance enhancing. Um, I'm going to start using the word constructive to describe those cultures, and 
uh, defensive to be describing the unadaptive or non-performance enhancing ones. So these are divided out into two columns. And we'll take a look here at the top. What are the core values of the managers in the constructive cultures? Well, the focus is on customers, shareholders, and employees. The value has to do with producing useful change. Let's compare that with the unadaptive, the defensive cultures. The managers tended to focus on themselves or their immediate work group. It's very turf driven. And the approach to change uh, really had to do with reducing risk. Okay? And leadership initiatives took a back seat to reducing risk. Now, if we looked at some of the behaviors between the two, common behaviors of the managers, managers uh, on the adaptive side, the constructive side, would attend to their constituencies and their customers, their staffs, the supply chain. Those were important and would be attended to. If they needed change to serve interests, even if it took risk, they were willing to do it in those organizations. Contrasted with the defensive cultures, the unadaptive or non-performance enhancing ones, um, managers tended to be political, um, behave bureaucratically, and they weren't really interested so much in changing their strategies as they were uh, keeping the status quo. So here in a nutshell, the big difference is focus on others and change for the adaptive or constructive cultures, focus on protecting turf and resisting change for the unadaptive. And when you think about the, the data that I presented in the previous slide, it might explain some of the results that we see. So what's your role in this if, as an owner, as a leader of your business? Well, it's interesting because the message in this is that staff is watching you. You are on stage every minute. The staff is looking for clues on how, how to fit in. How do I fit in here? What does success look like? Because, hey, you're modeling it. Who gets what? Who are the favored? Who are the ignored in your shop? And this is one of my favorites is what happens in a crisis. Do you yell and scream if there's a problem? Is there a lot of finger pointing? Um, do you use a more of a fact-based objective problem solving uh, method? Do you pull your team together? These are things that everybody sees and is extremely visible. So I'll, I'll share another story uh, out of my distant past as an engineer, I was working for a major electronics manufacturer named uh, to remain nameless. Uh, they had a stellar reputation for technology. But if you had to describe their management approach at that organization, I described it as management by intimidation. So that was, the place was rife with name calling, belittling, um, what we would now call bullying and behavior in the workplace. Well, what happened was that was what was valued. This, the management team in place at the time promoted people for being butt kickers. That's what they wanted in management. And they believed that this gave them a better product. The thing that they weren't counting on is everybody quitting. My department had almost 100% turnover in the two years I was there. And there was longtime staff, 20 plus year staff members that decided they'd had enough and that they were going to go move on. So all that intellectual capital just walked right out the door. Message here, culture happens. So do you want to create and steer it, or do you want to let it happen on its own? Personally, I do not believe that's the best way to go. So here are some signs of culture. Um, this, these things represent, might, might represent culture, uh, give you some hints and clues. So symbols, uh, things like dress. So if I were to say IBM to some of you old timers around there, you might be thinking of suit and tie. Okay, now even if the dress code isn't relevant anymore, IBM in my mind is really tied to dress and grooming in that way as a symbol of their culture. Status, who gets the window office? Who gets the corner office? Is another way that status shows up. Um, myths and legends, so remembering the stories about Lee Iacocca, the Lone Ranger who rescued Chrysler, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. There's a lot of mythology around those leaders of those businesses. Physical plant. This is interesting. I walked into a, an organization to talk to them about a consulting gig, 
uh, not too long ago, and I walk in the door, and I'm looking around. It's so quiet in there. You couldn't even hear people on the phone. Um, people were either at their desks or talking very quietly. There was a um, picture of the founder on the wall and a few standard sterile um, litho prints on the walls. But there was no character, there was no energy in this place whatsoever. So it started to give me some ideas about what that might, organization might be like to work in and possibly work with as a client. Language is another thing that comes up. I was in the defense business for a long time. Uh, anybody that's worked around the military knows that there are acronyms for everything. And really, if you know the acronyms or the jargon, some people will use that as a weapon uh, to exclude you from uh, promotions and things because you're not in the in-group if you don't understand what the acronyms and jargon mean. So that's a way that language can be used as an artifact of culture. And then leadership style. Uh, I think of Mary Kay with her pink Cadillacs and enthusiasm and fun. It's another way of looking at uh, artifacts of culture. One more thing here that I want to share with you is what I'll call levels of culture. So it's possible that you may have multiple cultures at play in your organization. There's usually a dominant culture, so that's the big circle in the middle here. Um, but sometimes there are subcultures that develop that end up with certain characteristics that they share with the dominant culture and certain characteristics that are truly their own. So where might you see this happen? Remote locations. So you might have a shop um, in another part of the country, another part of the world even, that might have some uh, similarities to the dominant culture, but it might be have their own. So managing this interface of overlap uh, can be a, a tricky dance, is what I'll say to that. Now, there's also the opportunity for an organization to say, you know what, we need something completely different. And this is referred to as a counterculture. As you can see, there's virtually no overlap of the characteristics of the dominant culture with the counterculture. And my favorite example here is the Lockheed Skunk Works that was formed back in the 40s because the Lockheed felt that uh, that the war effort needed some breakthrough innovation. The only way to get there from here was to take this group, segregate them from the rest of the, uh, the company that was busy building airplanes for the war effort uh, to come up with the things that they felt they needed to do to unlock breakthrough technology and innovation. So an example of counterculture. All right. So I hope everybody's followed that well enough because now I'm going to show you a model of how culture works. And this is b based on the work of the folks at Human Synergistics. They are a consulting firm based in Chicago with offices around the world and have been heavily involved in culture work for a number of years. And I've been uh, happy to have been affiliated with them as a practitioner. And so I'm going to be sharing with you the model that they use uh, for culture and how these pieces start to fit together. So let's take a look at how this works. On the left here, we have a, a box uh, under the heading of causal factors. And there's some pieces here that I want to just touch on briefly. So everything starts with assumptions and espoused values. So what are those? And who owns them? Well, it's the leadership team. Leaders and managers, oftentimes it may be the owner or the owner group, but they have some assumptions about leading, managing, people, technology, and then they espouse or talk about their values. We value innovation. We value our people. We value strong financial performance. Whatever those things are presumably creates what we'll say is an ideal culture for that organization. However, oftentimes these things are not written down. The values, the assumptions, and the ideal culture is never documented. Things can um, take interesting twists from here. We're, we're going to see that in a few minutes. From this starting point, the organization's mission, vision, and philosophies come together. And these will produce the goals and strategies for that business. All right. Now, what happens from here? Well, these things now uh, drive a set of, we'll call them influences. We can also call them change levers. 
But this set of causal factors, the structure systems, technology and skills and qualities, uh, is, sets in place the, the way you do business. So let's think about this. Structures have to do with the empowerment systems that are running into your, in your organization, who's able to influence whom. Uh, the systems piece here has to do with your human resource management, your goal setting, your appraisal systems, uh, and reward and punishment, if you want to think of it that way. Technology here really refers to job design, not so much use of computers or robotics or anything like that. It's really about how your job is designed uh, for autonomy, how they design for interdependence, those kinds of things. And the skills really talk to the skills of the management and leadership team and how they, um, how they resolve conflict, how do they manage work, how do they manage people. All right, so this grouping now will drive and create the operating culture of the organization. All right, again, this is how things really get done. It's also referred to as the current culture. Because if you remember back here, we talked about an ideal culture and where the ideal culture should come from. But these can be very different, the ideal and the operating culture, as we're going to see in a minute, because if the structure, systems, technology, and skills piece is not aligned with this, you can get something else entirely different than what you had originally thought you were going to get. And last piece of the of the model now talks to the outcomes. Um, culture gets experienced by obviously by the staff at the individual level. It also shows up uh, but with teams. So how well do teams work together? How do they work uh, internally or with other teams? Um, I, I neglected to mention at the individual level, what will show up here? Job security issues, uh, feelings of satisfaction and motivation, cord and, and, and um, intention to stay with the organization. So is this, are these things climate related? Yes, very much climate, because culture created these, everyone's impressions here of these outcomes. At the organizational level, we'll be talking about things like perceptions of quality of the organization's services, uh, adaptability, ability to respond to external influences. Okay. So again, we walk this through. A spouse values, ideal culture, vision, mission, creates the structure, systems, technology, and skills, which then creates the operating culture and these set of outcomes. So I hope everybody follows that because, let's see, all right, I did get an, uh, a question, a comment from uh, from the audience, and um, I would be happy to get into that question at the end here if, uh, if you guys so wish. So let me move on. Oh, yes, one more thing. This whole picture isn't static because there's one missing piece, set of missing pieces here. There are influences outside the organization that will show up. And so, for instance, we've got resource availability. This has to do with money and people and, and equipment and demands which might have to be, uh, that are on the outside of the organization that have to do with um, the economy, the competitive environment, the legal environment, uh, that are going to push and pull on this whole structure. And where are we going to feel it? We're going to feel it here, at the individual team and organizational level. So if we were to bring this home a little bit, Think about this, answering this question. Which behavior do you want in your shop? So let's look at the story of two employees. Everything here, by the way, below the dotted line, everything below the dotted line is internal. We can't really see it. Everything above the dotted line here are things that we can see in here. So let's say that both employees here share a value. They both value hard work. Both of them believe hard work will get them ahead in the organization. So let's look at person number one. Person number one's attitude about this is, I'm going to be a good team player. And this person's behavior set might look like, I'm going to share information, I'm going to go the extra mile to get, my, to get things done, and I'm going to go to classes to be better at my craft. Okay, that's person one. Person two, with the exact same set of values and, and beliefs, 
um, the hard work. I value hard work. It's going to get me ahead. Attitude here, I'm going to get ahead at your expense. And the behavior set might look like I'm going to steal other people's ideas, I'm going to hoard information, and oh, by the way, I'm going to be verbally abusive to make myself look good. Okay, so which behavior do you want showing up in your organization? Which behaviors are valued? Think about my electronics company story. Which are tolerated? Which are allowed to persist? Think about those causal factors, those structure skills and qualities, and how they play into this. What are you encouraging? What do you want? What do you need? So at this point in the presentation, I am going to um, introduce you to a tool that one of the tools that I use to look at culture, and this will give you kind of an overview of what's possible, and then share some results from my um, uh, some of my consulting projects. So the Organizational Culture Inventory, which is a product of human synergistics, assesses the ways people in the organization are expected to think and behave relative to tasks and people. The key word here is expected. What are they expected to do? And we're talking about, again, behavioral norms. What does it take to fit in and succeed? These are unwritten rules about what to do and what not to do, although sometimes they are written, and they apply to everybody. So with expectations, I mean, how do you get messages to fit in and succeed? Well, you watch what people are getting away with. You might be told by others. You know, when I went to work uh, at, some, at some places as an employee, people would say, hey, you wanna, this is how things get done around here. You want to fit in. Here, here's what you really have to do. You might be... It might be in your job description. It might be in your performance reviews. You might guess if there's no direction. You might just do your own thing, whatever works for you or works someplace else. So behavioral norms being clarified are really important. So how can I represent culture? And I, I know this slide is, is kind of busy here, so I'm hoping you're going to be able to read it. Um, but the 12 styles that make up culture per the human synergistics model, are broken out around the outer rim here of this tool which is called a circumplex. It's a circular graph. And I'm going to break these down for you uh, individually, just give you an idea of what the expectations are. But just note that there are 12 of these. Okay? And the styles at the bottom of the circumplex re uh, represent uh, satisfying our needs for security. And what kind of security? It's really physical and psychological security. The needs at the top of the chart that get satisfied here are higher order satisfaction needs, which are uh, talking to our needs for achievement and working together and appreciating each other. The styles that are more on the right side of the chart represent an orientation to people, and the styles that are on the left side are an orientation to task. So you can see that there are rings, concentric rings, going out from the center. The further out you go, and when I'll show you the data, the further out you go in this pie slice, the more strongly that culture is represented. Thinking back to Cotter and Heskett's work, the more intense that style appears. Okay. So we're going to take a look at these three clusters. They're called constructive, passive defensive, and aggressive defensive, and just take a look real briefly at what those look like. So the constructive cluster consists of four styles, achievement, self-actualizing, humanistic encouraging, and affiliative. So think about the expectations here for achievement. And, and I'll just give you a few tip-offs tip here for achievement. Members are expected to set challenging but realistic goals and plans to meet them. This is pretty clear. Self-actualizing uh, is really about learning and risk-taking. Um, so members are expected to enjoy their work, develop them th themselves, and take on new activities. So here's where your innovation will come from. Humanistic. Members are expected to be supportive, constructive, and open to two-way influence. This is a great style that promotes mentoring and, and employee development. And the last one in this grouping, affiliative, this is all about teamwork. Members are expected to be friendly, cooperative, and sensitive to the needs of the work group. So there's some outcomes 
that are associated with constructive cultures. Big focus on safety, superior customer service, um, proactive, involved, uh, energetic workers, and as we've seen earlier here, superior financial results. But there's some other things that come with this too. You'll see high levels of teamwork. Um, you can read the bullets on here, safety, motivation, role clarity, and importantly, reduced levels of stress, uh, insecurity, and turnover, which is very expensive uh, and really is a huge distraction to the workforce. So you can see here some of these things will start to talk to climate as we talked earlier. So let's move to the next cluster. As you see as we move around the circumplex, we're becoming more people oriented. This passive defensive style is really about self-protection through people. The four styles are shown here. And let's talk about what they mean. Approval. Members are expected to agree with and be liked by others. Taken to an extreme, now think about it this way, don't rock the boat. Uh, conventional, really follow the rules. Uh, conform, this is more of a by the book style. Uh, dependent, ex members are expected, again that's the key word, to do what they're told and clear their decisions with the management chain. This is a follow the leader type of style. And the last one in this grouping is avoidance. So members are expected to shift responsibilities to others and don't get blamed for problems. Avoid, can't be <laughs> any more clear than that. So these aren't necessarily bad things, it's just the extent to which they show up in your organization. So for instance, independent, well, it's good to have fo follow the leader to some extent, it's just that are you expected to think for yourself? And the same thing with conventional, it's good to have a book, but when's the last time you looked at your book? When was the last time you checked out whether there's another way to make that brisket? Okay. So what happens with um, these kinds of cultures? So some of the outcomes here, uh, role ambiguity and conflict. So who does what? What am I supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? And, and who's supposed to do what? And what's expected? Um, customer service. Uh, you can imagine what that's like. I mean, if you get a, suppose that you, you, you yourself ended up uh, wanting to talk to somebody about resolving a problem, and they say, just a minute, I gotta get my boss's approval, and they have to get their boss's approval, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I've had this experience with credit card companies, and uh, it's very frustrating. Okay. The last grouping here, the aggressive defensive, consists of these four items. This is a defensive style, security through task, oppositional power, competitive, perfectionistic. What are these? Well, an oppositional organization, members are expected to be critical and oppose new ideas. So this is a fight about it type of a culture. Power, quite simply, my way or the highway. Taken to an extreme, this is the sort of the t-shirts that the power people wear. Competitive, this is a I win, you lose, taken to an extreme, which is nice when you're thinking about taking on the competition and maybe not so nice when you're talking about uh, employees competing with each other. Maybe not a good idea, just depends. And the last one here is perfectionistic. Um, this is never make a mistake. And don't, you have to keep track of everything. You've got to be on top of everything. And you know, the thing about perfectionism is you can be happy or perfect, pick one. That's usually the story, uh, the one-liner that I throw out there. Uh, because at some point, you don't learn if you don't try. And if you don't make mistakes, you can't have a cycle of improvement. It can be very difficult. Apply where necessary. Be perfect where, where it counts. <clears throat> so some of the outcomes here, well, with all the fighting and yelling, who do you listen to? And you end up very often with a workforce that was frustrated, tense, feels under pressure, and some of us have left our organizations because of that. And if you think teams cooperate, forget it. This, is very, this becomes a very competitive and difficult place to work. So I'm going to show you some ways that culture profiles can be represented. Let me bring this together for you. So here we have a circumplex, and many organizations might ascribe, say, hey, that's my ideal. That's what I want to shoot for. Why is that? Well, look, we have some extensions in 
this green area here, sorry for the color changes on the, on the circumplex, but let's just talk, we know where constructive is, it's at the top, and this represents the best balance between task people and satisfaction. So where you have the extensions further out, this heavy ring in the round, the third, um, uh, this third ring here represents the median in the database, but it's also more correlated with organizational effectiveness the further out you go um, in the constructive cluster. So this organization is really looking for high levels of humanistic interaction as well as achievement, self-actualizing and affiliative. There are some desired characteristics in the passive defensive, uh, same in the aggressive defensive. We were leaked out here a little bit in, in competitive. I'd be, as a consultant here, I'd like to know what is driving this because you, especially if you said, told me that's your ideal culture. All right, but this is generally representative of what an effective organization is. Well, take a look at this one. Ineffective organizations often look like this. So we see here, this is primarily an aggressive defensive organization as I read this. The number one style here, the most extended, is avoidance. The number two is competitive. And gosh, where is the constructive stuff? Well, it's barely here. Um, so how can these two be different? You know what, this can be an ideal and a current in an organization. What's going on? Well, lack of intention for one thing, doing things the way they've always been done, no guidance from leadership, and maybe no one bothered to look at this when the company was built, they just went about their business of delivering product or a service. So I'm gonna share with you some data from some culture projects that I've been involved with, and I think you'll find them interesting, at least I hope so. There's two of them here, XYZ Financial and ABC Printing. So maybe you've done business with them. So let's take a look at XYZ. Um, there we go. There we go. XYZ. I'm sorry. Here we go. XYZ is financial. XYZ is a division of a nationally known public company in the financial services market. Now the project that I was brought in on was to map out the culture and change opportunities because a new leader, senior leadership team was appointed here. And they spent a ton of money on strategic planning and wanted to see what organization they had to carry this out. And that is an excellent reason to look at their culture, by the way. So N equals 20 implied we had 20 people involved in creating this ideal culture. And what they came up with was, not surprisingly, something not all that different from what we looked at for an effective organization. Uh, their primary cluster was constructive. Their number one style for this group was humanistic. Number two was achievement. Uh, the oppositional level was at 50% here, and interestingly, um, Human Synergistics has a database for uh, other countries and other cultures, uh, ethnocultures around the world, and this is very typical for Western cultures, US, Canada, England, Australia, New Zealand, to see or prefer some extension in oppositional. Okay, that's what they wanted. Here's what they have, all right? Same 20 people. And their number one, their primary cluster is passive defensive. Their number one style is avoidance. Their number two is approval. And nowhere near the constructive cl uh, culture style expectations that they said they wanted to, be, to maximize their effectiveness. So what's going on? Well, interestingly enough, the person that was in charge of that division could very easily be described as a bully. And in interviews that we conducted, my colleague and I with the staff, we found this out in a hurry. And in the meeting where we were sharing our data for the group of 20, he personally attacked both of us, impugned our credibility, and we ended up stopping the meeting, started shooting holes in the tool, and we said, you know what, we're leaving. And we started to pack up, and the COO, who happened to be in the room, turned around and says, excuse me, let me talk to him. Well, it turns out the COO had hired that person and handpicked him to run that, this division because he was brilliant. And I, don't, I forgot how many PhDs this guy had, but unfortunately he was a bully. And for them to proceed in that or, uh, on their way in this, or, in this organization, they ended up getting rid of 
this, this, the person that was running it, which was a very tough decision for them. Uh, but it freed them up for people to do what they needed to do. One more example here, and then we'll pause and see if any questions come in here that I can address. Uh, this is ABC Printing Company. Uh, this is a transnational printing company with operations in the U.S. and sales offices in Mexico and South America. There are two owners. They have a big focus on quality because they surface, serviced a lot of very large corporate customers. So here's their ideal. Look at this. They wanted very high levels of constructive. Um, their number one style, again, humanistic encouraging. Number two was self-actualizing. They were a very innovative company, had a number of patents. And number three was achievement. Here's op interestingly oppositional popping out a little uh, past the third ring. But by and large, this is what they wanted. What did they have? 202 people participated in this culture survey. So let's take a look at this. Highly aggressive defensive. The number one extension here, their primary style was oppositional. Their number two was avoidance. Number three was power and competitive. And where is, where's the affiliative? I mean, it's barely a heartbeat here. <laughs> we called this profile fight, duck, and run. It was a very tense place to work. Okay, but wait, it gets better. This is data, and this isn't all the data, but I'm going to share with you from different places within the organization and around the country here. Um, these guys were consistent. You have to give them credit. They repl replicated that fight, duck, and run culture in every department and every location. And these aren't even, this isn't, as I said, this isn't everything. So here we have corporate, corporate, these are the, these are the, this is the corporate office here where the two owners live. Min the plant manufacturing plant here in Minnesota, there's one on the East Coast. Look at this. The U.S. sales and marketing, hardly any response here out of, the, out of the constructive side. So I'm briefing this with the group. Now, the one, the one owner, the Mr. Nice Guy, I'll call him, was very disappointed. Uh, very, it, took the owner, it took the data to heart. Uh, but the other owner, Mr. Volatile, I'll call him, went and ripped my head off, stomped out of the room, blamed me for everything, decided that the tool, again, there was something wrong with it. And... Um, even though I had all this data and a bunch of supporting data uh, from focus groups and interviews that I led that backed it all up, he didn't, wasn't going wasn't gonna to take all this uh, sitting down. So he stomped out of the room, and he came back in, settled down a little, and I said, hey, you hired these people. They're trying to tell you something. Okay? So my process will allow me to go back in and take a look at the structures, skills, technology, and move forward here that created this culture. So if you want to change your outcomes and you want to change your culture, you need to change your structures, systems, technology, and skills. And if you need to align them with your ideal because they are grossly different, we need to go back here and make sure those messages uh, are clear. All right. And I'm going to wrap up here because we're starting to push, on, push the clock. Um, in summary, I would say to you, culture happens, so be intentional about it. If you don't spell out what you expect, you're just going to get what you get, and you may not like what you get. As a leader, you're embedding culture by what you say and do. Your staff and customers are watching you. It's really up to you. And who owns culture? You do. First you, and then your management team. You need to get the buy-in from everyone that this is how we want to operate. Culture statements are nice, but I'm a big believer in culture statements, but if they are just pretty wall plaques, they're, it's not going anywhere. You can't change culture by decree. You have to act. How do you act? You look at those structures, skills of your management team, the systems, the job designs to support the culture that you are shooting for. If you're, if you're an organization that promotes participative decision making, are you going to hire somebody with a command and control mindset to be a manager? If you say you stand for innovation and you're big in, about finding creative solutions to customer problems, are you going to shoot down any ideas that come from the staff about ways to make things better? Are you going to shoot the messenger for speaking up in the first place? Um, 
Will you reward employees or bosses who are bullies? Is it okay to make mistakes? Um, what I would, I, I would prefer if you have questions to send them in uh, by written, and I will attempt to address them. And as I said, we will get at those at the end here. Um, lastly, constructive cultures equal high expectations. Constructive cultures can be difficult places to work if you're a slacker. Slackers aren't tolerated. You have to pull your weight. You can't hide problems. They need to be in the open. Everyone needs to participate and work together. Um, people will regularly review processes and procedures for continuous improvement. You can't just hang on the way things have always done. The payoff, the ROI established by Cotter and Heskett shows it is possible to come out and win big time. Okay. I will uh, do my best to uh, address any questions that you send in uh, through the chat box. There was a question here about access to the PowerPoint slides after the webinar. Because there is client data in here, I'm not going to be making the slide deck available. But if there are particular slides you are interested in, you can get a hold of me through, uh, well, here's my contact information. Send me an email. Let me know which slides you are interested in. And I'll see if I can put together some kind of a, <clears throat> um, a set of things that will ad address your interests there. Um, Mark, Adam had a question. Adam Messner had, <coughs> excuse me, had a question. <coughs> you can scroll up into the chat box a little yep. bit. I see. Um, about the, he runs a tech company and, mm -hmm. and Google has a culture of freebies, mm -hmm. laundry, food, exercise facilities. If you don't have a massive infrastructure of budget, what are some good cultural offerings that a small business can offer to compete with big companies' offerings? Okay. Well, I guess uh, the way I would answer this is to consider who you are interacting with. What do they want? How do they want to be treated? What are the things that they're looking for? Um, if you have a culture that is really outwardly focused, and is really good at listening to the voice of the customer, I would challenge you to say that freebies uh, are only going to go so far. And if you're looking to build a loyal customer base, people that will come and do business with you uh, because they want to do business with you if they have other choices, what are the things that you believe you can do to build that kind of loyalty? And I, I believe it goes beyond um, <clears throat> uh, it, it goes beyond the freebies. <clears throat> so the infrastructure of budgets uh, have to do, in fact, and here I'm, a, I'm approaching this with dealing with the customers. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm off base by doing that with customers, is it really more about employees? I think it's more about employees because okay. with Google, um, I believe a lot of their freebies, quote unquote, are with respect to the things that they give, um, provide to their employees. Okay. Um, it's very tough to go up against what somebody is willing to spend lots of money on. Um, but what, I, what I've learned in my career is that the grass isn't always greener. And uh, I used to employ a bunch of really high-end integrated circuit designers in my day, and they, were, they had a tendency to go where they got the best perks. Um, but after a while, you become unemployable <laughs> on their side of things because of all the jumping around. Um, and I believed it was best to, for me to focus on the environment that I could provide for people that would not only meet their needs, but have them feel like they're part of something special. Um, and that requires some heart-to-heart -heart discussions with the management team of the, of the organization. And what do the employees want? What do they need? And how, you can, how can you provide them? And I, I would love to be more specific than that, but would need more to go on. So I'm hoping I'm at least addressing the essence of the issue. 